we're going to get started now, and I'm recording, and I'm just going to introduce myself, and I'm uh, Son Nelson. I'm the artist behind Spine, and uh, we also have Nate in here, who is uh, the programmer, and I've listed uh, uh, some topics that we'll be going through, um, and to start up with, we're just going to go through the general workflow in Spine, um, and this is mainly uh, set up uh, versus the animate mode. Uh, we're going to go through the basics of setting up a skeleton and putting images on it. Then uh, we're going to go through using skins and then we are going to get started with animation. And by then, if we need a small break, we'll take a 10 minute break. And then after the break, uh, we're going to go into some more detailed animation uh, using the, the graph and uh, just tweaking the animation so it becomes more lifelike. Uh, then quickly we're going to go through exporting data and after that uh, jump into Photoshop for a bit and show us a quick workflow on how to you know, quickly cut out the, the different pieces to use in Spine. And after that uh, we're going to have a more uh, thorough question session you, but you can also ask questions during. And after that we will be concluding it and take maybe a couple of minutes to just uh, talk about what we've gone through. So if you have any questions before we start, uh, now's the time. All right. Doesn't sound like there is anything. All right, so I'm just going to get started. And uh, as you can see, I have a spine open here already. And hopefully it should be following around the, the cursor so you can actually see what's going on. Okay, we have a question from Nate here. So it looks, oh, looks like he loaded his hand again. All right, so I'm just going to get started. And uh, I'll be building uh, a, a small thing here, a small ninja character I've been working on. Uh, but before I do that, I'm just going to go through the workflow. Uh, so when you open up Spine, you'll be in uh, setup mode. And setup mode is, is basically where you, create, where you create everything. Uh, whereas animate mode is where you take what you've created in a setup mode and start animating it. Uh, the cool thing about this is that if you change uh, your setup posts in, in setup mode, it will propagate through to your, your animate mode. So uh, if you move something in setup mode, it will also be moved in animate mode. But you'll, you'll see more of that when we, when we get to that. So in the, in the bottom, we have all the, the major tools. And as I use them, I'll, I'll go through them in more detail. And on the right side, we have the tree. And we have the, the filter buttons up here uh, for filtering the bones, the slots, the images. And then we have this button here, which uh, will expand and scroll the tree to the editor selection as the tool success. So I'll just turn that on now and actually get started on, on creating this first character. And for those of you who've seen the, the quick overview video, uh, it's, it's pretty much the, the, the same thing, uh, except here I'll, I'll be doing it a little slower, and again, you can ask questions while I'm doing it. So usually the first thing I do is I drag in a uh, template. Um, and I'm just going to find that here. So we have this, uh, gonna save, save this thing up first, sorry. And there we go. And go to the images. And this is where you can find your images. I'm just gonna browse it. And I know I already had it set up um, to what I want. I'm just gonna select this folder here. So, so just, just briefly, the, the reason he saved his project is because the path that he specified for the images node um, the, the, it shows the images under the path you specify. So uh, at the bottom of the tree, you can see the path is empty. So it will show all images in whatever directory you save the project. Yeah, you don't select uh, images, uh, single images. You don't go in and select the single image. You actually select the folder instead, and it will load all the images. And this means that it also, if you save an image, uh, if you update an image, uh, from your image editor, 
uh, it will also update automatically in Spine. So, okay, but um, I'm just gonna get started on, on creating this first skeleton here. And usually I like to, to work with a template. So I've created this template of the ninja that I'll be setting up here. And there's two ways you can actually get the image in. And one way is to just drag it into the scene. Another one is to uh, click set parent and then select the bone or you can drag it up to the to the root as well. For this I'll just be dragging it in so I get uh, get it at the position where I want it. So I've got the template in now. Just gonna zoom out so you can see the the actual size and frame it so we get the entire thing. And with this in um, it will now be placed under the root. And before I actually start uh, creating uh, the bones and everything, I'm just going to uh, select the slot here where the, the image is placed under. And I'll, I'll go through um, what slots are and how they can be used um, uh, a bit later on. But for now, just going to select the slot and click this button down here to change the color. And the reason I do this is I want to be able to, to distinguish the images that I drag in from my template. So I hit space to deselect and I'm going to get started creating the, the bones. So first, disable selection of the image so I don't accidentally select it. Click the create button down here and it already have, has the root selected. And I'll just get started with the first bone here. And I usually create the hip bone first. And the reason I do that is when you're animating, you don't actually do animation on the root bone. Um, so if, if I wanted uh, this guy to jump, I wouldn't be moving the, the root. I would actually be doing it on the hip uh, to, to move that, to translate that out. Because um, you want to have uh, like a, a point in space that is, is where you actually, you know, so you will always know where the root is. So with the hip bone selected, and it's now created on the root, I'm going to create the torso. And I just left click and drag. Now, because I have the hip bone selected, uh, it will be created uh, under that. Then with that created, I'm going to create the head. And then I have these two hair strands up here that I want to be separate. So I'm going to create two small bones for that. And select the bone here again. So now I have those two bones underneath. Then select the torso. Uh, create this hand here, right hand, select the torso again, create the left hand, then select the hip, and I'll create uh, this foot here. I know mostly this is an idle pose, so mostly he will be running or walking or jumping or something like that, so mostly the foot will actually be pointing uh, this way, so that's why I'm creating it like this. Once again, select the hip, oops, let me do that. Select the hip and draw this out again. And last, I need to create this thing here for the belt. And for the small uh, hood ends here as well. So they, they have something to, to pivot around. So, um, Everything is just called bone, one, two, three, so on. So I'm just going to rename them. And the first one I'm going to rename is the hip. You just double click it. And torso. Just going to do this really quick. And then the right foot, left foot, and the belt ends. The head, right hand, and left hand, and the uh, hood ends, and I have the hair, so I'll call this one hair one, this one hair two, and I think I got all of them now actually, let's check. Yeah, that looks right. So now I'm actually ready to, to already start dragging in the, uh, the different uh, images. So 
to do that, just go to the images that I already have expanded here. And I'll just first, um, I'll just select the torso image here. Click set parent or hit P and select the bone that I want it to be added to. Then a dialog pops up here and it will ask me the name of the, the slot that the image will place under. So I'm just going to hit OK because I don't want to change that. So I enable selection of the images and disable selection of the bones. Hit V to go into translate mode and move it into place. I'm just going to do this pretty quickly for uh, all the different bones. Oh, sorry, all the different images. And let's see. And if you have any questions while I'm doing it, then just, just go ahead and ask. Um, does the program come with uh, any templates? Uh, you, uh, you mean image templates or, or skeleton templates? Yeah. Um, well, like the stuff that you're using here, like this little ninja example, um, is any of that included so that we could sort of run through these tutorials ourselves? Uh, the the uh, uh, small ninja guy here isn't including the examples yet, but he, he will be. Uh, I'm doing uh, some more animations with him, so there's, there's going to be uh, a little more to work with, but if if you want the if you want the uh, the project uh, after this uh, workshop, uh, we can we can definitely uh, put it up somewhere for you so you can download it. Yeah, that sounds there good. there are other examples. There's a there's a dragon example. We have a spine boy, a power up, and a UI spinosaurus example, as well as a goblin project that that you can see. And they, they do have, um, I believe they all have the, the template image, which is the fully assembled character that you can use to do this exact thing that he's doing. If you wanted to create a project from scratch using those art assets. Yeah. Um, I'll, also, I noticed that some of the um, the node that you've made, you know, have the line coming out of it, which I figure is pivot point and, and the bone length. But the ones that you have on the hood end and on the hair don't have that. Um, you mean these up here, the ones that are yeah, marked? yeah. Um, it's it's basically uh, the length uh, that decides uh, how they look. And I can just I can just quickly show you actually. So if I select this one here, and it's, I can since there's it's. Uh, there's no length on it. I can't just drag it out, so I can change the length down here. And if I do that, uh, let me just make it a little, whoa, that was a little too much. You can actually see that it's it is ah, just interesting. so it they are the exact same, but we just wanted them to not take up as much space, so we made these uh, actually change how they look depending on the length. So will you add length to those later when you animate it? Uh, not for these. Uh, these don't actually need length because these. This is just a pivot for for the image to to rotate around. Um, same with the hip. Uh, they they work just like bones. Uh, it's just a visual representation of them. Okay. Okay. So let's see. Which one did I add that to? Uh, here. Here one. Let's add it to. See, that's, that's wrong. So I'm just going to move this up here and rename this one. I just dragged it up. All right. I'm going to do the same with this because they're a little close to each other. So there we go. And then we have the hood ends here. Okay, so so that actually makes it for for all the uh, different images. They they've all been placed uh, for now. Uh, there's there's going to be multiple ones down here at the feet before I add those. I just want to make sure that the draw order is okay. So 
I'm just going to minimize the, the skeleton here or the root and the images as well, go into draw order. And here, uh, everything, the, the hood ends are now drawn on top of everything. So I want them to be drawn behind the head. So I'm going to drag the head up here. But I also want the hair strands uh, to be drawn in front of the head. So I take the uh, first, uh, this one, then this one. And now they're drawn on top. I'm just going to uh, hide the bones for now. And then we have, oh, here we go. Yeah, you had a question? Uh, yeah, I just may be skipping ahead a bit, but can you change that draw order on a frame by frame basis in an not animation? Current, not currently, uh, but it's something where uh, that was a part of one of our stretch goals, so it will be added. So you can actually animate. Oh, wonderful. Great. Okay, so uh, we want the right hand to be in front of the torso as well, which it is actually. Uh, we want the left hand to be behind the torso. Don't need the temp, uh, template to show anymore, so I'm just going to hide this. You, know, you can see the visibility out here, so I'm just hitting the template. And let's see the right foot in front of the torso. Belt end should be behind the right right foot, so I'm going to move it down here. Uh, let's see, right hand in front of the belt ends. It takes a little a little tweaking to to get it right. There might be some of them I've missed, but you can always go back to the setup pose and change it. So. So with the, the draw to set up, um, like I have now, actually this one looks wrong, so so let me just uh, fix that one. Uh, we have the left foot that needs to go behind buildings. There we go. So now it looks right. The reason I, I did this now is because I'm going to be adding more images to the same slot. Um, and because I have uh, three images more per foot that I want to add. But I add them to the same slot, which means they'll be getting the same draw, draw order, and I don't have to go in and set that again. So I'm just going to do that quickly. Um, I'm going to find the uh, name and selection of the bones again. So I have the right foot, and I have, as you can see, there's some more images here that I want to add. Um, I'm going to take this and set the parent to this one. And I'm, now, as you can see, there's already a slot there. So I can choose to use the existing slot or create a new one. I'm just going to use the existing one. And I'm going to do that for all of them. And then, let's see. I have a technical question about the drawing order. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, basically, I have looked at the JSON file uh, exported from a, one of the template projects. Um, how is that determined in the file? Is it just the actual uh, logical order of the files that, of the of the different parts that determines the drawing order, or is there another way to keep track of that? There's a in, in, in the JSON in the binary. There's a slot section, and the order that the slot slots appear is the order is the draw order for okay. the bind codes. Thank you. I just I just went ahead and added. Say bind the, pose. The, Sorry. Yeah, I just went ahead and added the uh, the other images to the right foot here. Uh, but this time I just I just drag them up to the bone. I'm just going to do the same for the for the left foot. So. This would be a good time to use filters so you don't have to drag so far. Oh, was there another question? Popped up and disappeared. That doesn't look like it. <laughs> right, so I have all the matter now. Oh, another question. Let me get that first. Uh, yes. Um, what's the difference between the, the red and green little icons and the images that you're using? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, the, the green one means they're in use. The red one means they're not used. Ah, very nice. So as you can see, I I have some here from from an older like uh, like this one. Um, it's it's an older version that I just used to to test out or you know a rough sketch of of the character that I did before I worked on anything else. And in use just means on the stage or attached to some bone at some point. Yeah, these uh, 
I mean, the, the red ones are not attached to anything. The green ones are. That means they're, they're used, if that was your question. Yeah, I think so. And it, it's just for setup mode? It's like it's being used in setup? Uh, it, it will it will be the same in animate mode. It, it will show as, as being used in animate mode as well. But the thing is, in animate mode, you can't draw uh, or drag, sorry, you can't drag new images to uh, um, to the to the skeleton. So you want to do that. Right. I'm wondering about like the ninja's foot, since that foot changes, um, if it would say that that front-facing foot is not in use if you're on a frame where it's not being used. Oh, okay, okay. Or if no, it, it it's still attached to the bone. It's so still it's... attached, yeah. So it will still say that it's it's being used. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So as, as you can see, uh, it looks a bit weird now. So I need to to tweak this. And the first thing I'm gonna do is change these to be the side and get them into the the correct position. And I'll have to move this bone a bit as well. And I'm just going to show you uh, what compensate does. So instead of actually getting it into position on the bone, um, I'd rather move the image where I want it to, and then afterwards move the bone. So to do that, I will put on uh, compensation, just image compensation here. Select this bone. Now I can move it without the, the image actually following. If I take this off, now it will follow. So, and this is the more to my liking, this, this position here. So with that uh, put in, uh, also going to make this dialog just a little bit. Going to need to set up the, the other images so they're in the right position, even if they're actually not going to be uh, visible on the, on the setup cursor. So take this one here and move it into position. It, this, this takes a little bit of tweaking uh, to, get, to get it into the right position. You can see that this needs to be moved a little to the left and then slightly down, and that's, that's closer. And then the same for this. There we go. And I'll need to do the same for the other one. I'm just gonna hide this foot. Meanwhile, so I can actually see what I'm doing here. So, like that position. We are actually making this a bit easier in the, in the future. To, to do this, so you don't have to sit and, and do that much uh, aligning of it. There we go. All right, so uh, that's, uh, that's set up now. I'm just gonna go ahead and, and actually save this out. Um, so we have this as we want it. Do you, do you think um, now would be a good time to talk about slots and what they are and things like that? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a good idea. So the slots are are added. Uh, it, it's kind of uh, a place that you you store the images, um, and this, uh, you can only have one image visible at a time per slot. But you can have as many slots um, as you want on a, on a bone. So the reason why we have slots is because then you can uh, you can define the you define the draw order uh, with the slots. Um, so you, let, in, instead of doing it on the bones, let's say that you actually had the draw order defined on the bones, then um, and you have two images on the same bone, but you want one image to be in front of something and the other image behind something. If the bone was actually uh, what was defining the draw order, then you couldn't do that. So the slots is, it was, uh, is what defines the draw order. And then you can have different draw order depending on, uh, on the slots you, you have. So you can have as many slots, like I said, on, on a bone. Uh, for this uh, project here, I only need to have uh, one slot per uh, uh, bone. 
but I have multiple images. Does that uh, uh, is that detail enough for you? Any questions about it? What? Guess not. They got it in one go. All right, then uh, we can get started on on doing some animation here. Um, let me just quickly see if I've forgotten anything here. Nope, I think we're good. So, well, actually, uh, there's one thing I want to go through before I actually jump into animation. But this this is uh, the skins feature. And just like I just saved the project again. Gonna open up the uh, the goblins. And if you've uh, been working with it, you've already seen these. And the goblin example here uh, has uh, these two skins. It has the, the goblin girl that you can switch to, and it has the, the goblin. And then on, on the, the skeleton, I'm just going to expand one of them. Instead of having uh, an image directly attached to a slot, I actually have uh, what we call as a uh, an attachment where you have the image. So the reason why we created this was so you can have an entire skeleton um, where you want to reuse that, but you want to be able to quickly swap out uh, to two other images for an entire character. One thing we, we have been talking about is, is actually um, expanding this feature so you can have multiple uh, skins visible at the same time so they'll be blending with each other so you could do things like uh, having different guns attached to uh, uh, a skin and then you could have different uh, helmets and so on um, and you'd just be able to switch between them by by clicking uh, uh, changing between the skins down here as you can see I have animation on this I'm just gonna Set it to playback. Uh, it might be a little slow on the on the video there, so I can just slow it down and do it manually. As you can see, there's animation here, and I can switch to the goblin, and it's using the exact same animation. There's there's no there's no tweaking done to to these animations at all. I'm just gonna quickly show show, show you how. You can do so. Um, if I could say something yeah. real quick. So the the you could have two characters and they could have all different images by just using slots. You don't you wouldn't need to use skins, um, and it it could work exactly the same at at, at runtime in your game. You could change all of the images that were attached to be the girl the goblin girl images, um, and and it would work just just like this example does. But um, the, the real power of the skins is that if you're animating and you change what images are shown, then you'll have a problem if you're only using slots. For example, if you had the goblin blinking halfway through this walk animation, um, you need to show different eyes. And so for the, for the green goblin, you need to show the green eyes. And for the goblin girl, you would need to show her eyes. Um, if you want to reuse the animation, you, you can't have that image change be specific for the type, the, the character that you're showing. Um, and by using the skin attachments, um, you hide and show the skin attachments. You don't hide and show the actual images. And that way, when you change the skin, the, which images are used for the eyes come from the skin and not from the animation. And that allows you to reuse all your animations without, without that problem. So the, the skins are really for reusing animations with the same skeleton. Um, but they're, they're not really for just changing out images. So if you had another weapon, instead of a spear, he had a little dagger or a sword, um, you would just put those in a slot. And then in your game, you would switch which image is shown. You wouldn't want to use a whole skin for that. Um, because it's not really designed. You don't need that the power of a skin just to change a weapon. And also, you can only have one skin active at a time. So if you're using skins to change what images are shown, um, instead of just showing them on the attachment, you will, you will run into a problem where you want to have uh, a different image shown on a different part of the character, and you're using a skin to change um, the sword. 
So you should definitely use slots if you have just simple image changes and use the skins where you want to reuse whole animations for the same skeleton. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions about that, um, just shoot. <laughs> we'll we'll go through them. It can be a the, the skins feature can be a bit difficult to grasp, um, and explaining it is well even worse, I think. So, but I'll I'll, I'll show you how you actually set them up. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do that now. I'm just gonna create a new project and do it in. Uh, but I'll use the the goblin images for this. So I'm just gonna find this here, and it's just gonna use the root bone. So the first thing you do is you create a new skin, and you just select the skins node here. Create a new skin. And we're gonna call this one gob uh, goblin, and then another skin. Uh, call this one the goblin girl, and then. Whatever you have active is actually what the, the images or the, the skins that you place will be placed on. So I'm going to start off with the goblin active and I will go to the uh, root here, create a new slot, then new skin attachment. I'm just going to call this one head and now have this here and find the head here and drag it up. So now I have this uh, this goblin here, but if I go to the skins and actually set the goblin girl to visible, nothing will be shown. So I need to. But as you, you might want to collapse. If you collapse the images, then you can see that it actually takes the image out of the tree when you change skins. There we go. So as you can see, the the attachment is still there. There's just no no image under it. So expand this again, drag the head out, and now I have this in here so I can switch between these two. And then you can, I mean, it, it, in this case, it's almost like just using a slot because there's no uh, direct uh, keying going on. But if I wanted to do this just without a, uh, just with a slot, like, like Nate said, I would actually have to go in and key it for the different animations. And that means uh, I would be in trouble if I actually have an animation uh, where I wanted to change out the, the different images. I would actually have to go and duplicate that animation and rekey everything that has to do with what images are attached. So that's why I would, would have the skins feature. I think this is a this is a good time. You can see that the the path to the image under the head and tree is cut off. So this would be a good time to show that you can make the tree bigger by dragging the. Yeah, you can you can rescale up here. So, all right, I'm gonna get back to the uh, spine spine boy. Unless you have any questions about uh, not sorry not spine boy Speedy or the ninja character. Uh, unless you have any questions about the the skin team. I'm guessing I'm skipping ahead a bit uh, there, but. Uh, I'm guessing you're going to cover uh, animation and having one animation on one, uh, two different animations. Uh, let me rephrase that. Uh, on one uh, specific uh, slot, if you put a skin attachment, mm -hmm. are you saying that you could have one animation, a different animation per skin on one skin attachment? You you can have you can have. Uh... You can have ten skins on one animation if you wanted to. Uh, that's a little confusing. You can have as many skins as you want on the same skeleton. Um, what a skin does is it, it allows you to specify, for example, uh, in this in this skeleton, he has a skin attachment called head. The actual image that's being shown comes from the skin. So in your animations, you you can hide and show the head as if it were an image, even though the actual image comes from the skin. And so that's what skins are doing for you. They're, they're an abstraction over what actual image is shown. Yeah. I, I, guess, I guess I can show you uh, how it would look if I, if I weren't using skins and what I would actually have to do. Uh, we're going to have to step quickly into uh, animation for this. Um,
but I'll, I'll just I'll just quickly show you um, how that will work. So it's going to hide this and create a new bone. Um, well, may, maybe I wasn't clear, or, or it, it, it's it's a bit confusing, but still it's pretty straightforward. Uh, I was looking at the the dragon example, yeah. where you have this the, the the wings that are animating basically, mm -hmm. uh, changing frame. Yeah. I was wondering if you 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 make a second skin for the the same dragon, uh, you could have a different set of images in your second skin for the yes. wing animation. Yes. Yes. Because okay. That that's actually a good use case for a skin. Is because you have the, you have the wings changing, and instead of showing in your animation, instead of showing you know the red wing at different positions, you would sh you would show the skin attachments at different positions, and then when you apply a skin, the skin attachments would show the appropriate images for like a red dragon or a blue dragon. Okay, perfect. Uh, it's super clear now. Thanks. All right, cool. Well, in that case, uh, I'll open up the Speedy project here again and uh, actually get started on the animation. So, click up here in the top left corner, and we're now in animate mode. Let me just minimize this a little more. And down here you have the timeline, which has popped up. Uh, you have the playback buttons looping. Uh, we have the dope sheet that we can open, which is massive at this screen resolution, so I'm just gonna minimize a bit. So, uh, one thing I've noticed uh, in my original uh, graphics is the fact that the feet are a little too close to his torso. So before I do that, I'm just going to move this up. And I go back to setup mode to do that. I'm just going to move the, the, the torso up. And then back to animate mode here. Usually uh, when I start doing animation, um, I think about what kind of uh, movement I want. And in this animation, I'm just going to do uh, a quick run cycle because they're, they're, they're relatively fast and they show a lot of uh, weight. And basically, when you're thinking about animation, weight is... Um, you, you don't think about so much motion. Uh, like, if, if you're sitting thinking, how do I animate a specific thing? You think more about weight, really. I mean, you have the motion in there, but you think about how the weight makes everything interact with each other, and um, I'll I'll show you uh, some some examples of uh, of some animations that are actually really stiff. Actually, I can I can do that now. I uh, have a small video because so I'm just going to share that. And now I'm sharing a video instead, and I'm just going to play this back, and you can see. In this animation, I have uh, two animations, and there's one that only has linear uh, uh, peeing, and it has no uh, squash and stretch in it, so it looks really stiff. I'm just going to play it back now so you can see. So, as you can see, it looks, it looks pretty stiff, and now I switch to the one that has much more sense of weight in it this squash and stretch going on and also the way that he, he comes up to the top uh, with the torso and it, it takes him a little longer to actually fall down uh, from the gravity. So I'm just going to play it back once more so you, so you can see it. So again, linear. And then much more weight added to it looks like he's at, he actually has weight. Right. So I'm going to share my screen again here. And you should see the, the screen share again now. OK, so usually, and I'm going to be creating this animation from scratch. Um, usually, I start with the, the first pose here. And we have one animation here already created. I'm just going to rename that to run. And then I'm just going to start posing everything. So as you can see, I'm just going to be moving these really quick. Just If you have any questions about what I'm doing, just 
just ask because um, animation it, it usually takes quite a lot of time to to get it completely right so he's he's switching here between the translate tool and the rotate tool um, and there's a shortcut for that you can press the, the hotkeys or you can also press right click right click will toggle between the current tool and the last tool that you had selected so you can use that to easily switch between two tools which saves you from having to click on the, the toolbar a lot yeah one thing I noticed here instantly was that the quid ends are actually in, in front of the, the right arm I don't want that but before I change that I'm just gonna uh, key everything and I'm just gonna hit K and now I've keyed all the changes that, I, that I've made um, so I'm just going to go back to setup mode. The reason I, I keyed it before I go is if I go into setup mode now and then come back, all the, the changes that I've done, they, they will actually be lost because it doesn't save or store the changes that you, you've made before um, you've actually keyed it. So I'm going to go back into setup mode here, find the draw order, and I want the put ends to be behind the right hand, and then back into animate mode, and that looks correct. So uh, just gonna keep doing this for for a bit, get the right pose here. Then usually what I do in the first frame is I select all the all the bones except for the root, and then I key them again. So the reason I do this is because if I have um, I'm just gonna show instead. Um, Let's say the torso here, that I've done some changes to that, and I move it. It won't actually sh uh, won't actually show any interpolation between these. It doesn't interpolate between the setup pose uh, that you have. You actually need to key it on the first frame. So usually I just create some keys on the first frame, just so I know that the interpolation will be there. So I'm just going to get back to this. Sure. A couple things. Um... If you drag the dope sheet button, you can resize the dope sheet, which is very useful. Yeah, like this. Yeah. Yes. And also, um, he, he mentioned not to key the root, the root bone, and that's pretty important because you're going to want to set the root bone position at runtime so that you can position your guy where you want him. If you key the root bone, when you play your animation, it will, it, it, if you key translation, it will set the root bone position, the animation will. And that will be confusing for you why your animation doesn't show in the right place. All right, so I have the pose I want for the, uh, uh, the first frame here. Um, and then I know I wanted looping. And for this animation, I'm just going to go for something like 24 frames. So I'm just deselect everything here, collapse the tree, and select all the keys. Go to frame 24 and paste them in. And you have the copy, cut, delete, and paste buttons here. Now, well, there's no animation going on because I've just taken the, you know, the first frame and pasted it out onto the 24th frame. So I'm just going to go to frame 12, which is halfway through the animation. And then I'm going to do the uh, where the right foot is in front instead of the, uh, the left foot. Oh, sorry, uh, the, the left foot is in front, not the right foot. Let me put those into place here. Hit K to key it. And now I have, you can see they're actually moving. It doesn't look exactly great yet, but I'll get to that in just a bit. So on the keyboard here, I'm pressing the uh, W and S key to jump between these two. So I can quickly see if they are at the right spot. I can see just needs a little little bit of tweaking. It's it's not huge, but is there a place where all those shortcuts are listed? Uh, no, there there currently isn't. They're sort of a secret. Oh. Um, we did post it on the forums, but um, we, we do need the right documentation for the show. All right. 
they will be added to the to the doc. So now that I've done the shortcuts are shown in the tool tips. Yeah. I Sorry, the the shortcuts are shown in the tool tips if you mouse over the buttons and, and wait long enough. So they'll pop up here. If you if you hit F one, they will pop up instantly. So now that I've done changes, uh, now that I've done changes to uh, the the first frame, I did tweak the the foot slightly. I need to make sure that it actually looks the same on the on the last frame. So I'm just going to paste that in. And now I have this. So I'm going to switch to step mode here. Um, step mode is basically what happens when I have this active. Is there's going to be no interpolation between the uh, different keys. So as you can see, nothing is, is happening. It's not moving the legs. It still it still has data there, but with step mode active, you, you can't see it. And I like to work this way um, simply because then I can imagine um, how things would look instead of of actually trying to um, figure it out while I'm actually doing the animation, which I find a lot harder. So I'm going to get started on the, the next piece. And uh, now we want, we want this guy to uh, be at like one third um, of of the time it takes him to get from zero to twelve, so at the fourth frame here, we want to do a pose for that. And, and as you can see, I still have step mode on. We need to move the torso up because now his his legs would be longer. Also, raise it a little more. And do the same for the head. And then. Get this a little closer. And then on the eighth frame, um, we want to get this where he's starting to set off. So something like this. And this one here. Uh, this might actually be a little too far, but I'm just going to keep it for now. And then I also need to raise the torso even more and rotate it. Do the same for the head. That was maybe a little too much. Just like that. But this foot, uh, and this is why I have uh, multiple images. So I want this foot to start bending now. So I'm gonna just gonna go here to the tree, expand the uh, the slot uh, of the right foot, and select this image here. Set that visible, and then you have this uh, key dot up here that is orange. It means there's a change now. And if I click that, it turns red. And in here in the dog sheet, you can now see a key has been set. Now, because I didn't set a key on the first frame, it will be using that. So I'm just going to actually set that um, on the on that. Well, actually, it is using that. But there we go. OK, and then make sure that this fits. See that? And now it looks a little better, maybe a little too lean back. So tweak this a little and raise this slightly. That last key that you set, you set on the wrong keyframe. <laughs> so just like them and drag them over to move into another frame. Okay, so. Now as you can see, this frame, frame 12, no longer looks like the first frame with the torso. So I'm just going to select that for both the torso and the head, expand it here, and copy the keys I have on the first frame to frame 12. So something worth mentioning probably is that um, the dope sheet shows the, the keys for the selected bones. 
if you have no bones selected, it shows all of the bones. And as soon as you select a bone, you only see the keys for those bones. And there's a there's a way to stop that from happening. If you click the little lock icon, then it will not show the selected bones. It will it will keep whatever bones it currently has. And there's a refresh button that updates. Yeah. So like the it's Stokes here, the toys here, uh, the toys and the food. And click the lock button here. Then if I deselect everything, it won't change. And if I select this foot here, still no update. So I can click this refresh button to actually make it update. So you can it's locking your selection. All right. Uh, quick question. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, are there any plans for uh, like an auto key feature? So you know a key gets added just by um, making a change to one of the bones at you know position on the timeline. Yeah. Uh, there are some plans for that. I would say uh, right. it's it's a bit it's a bit dangerous to use because uh, you sometimes end up with a lot more keys than you actually want. So use it with yeah. With keys. Yeah, I figure just with the repetitive actions, it could speed things up a bit. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, if you're careful, if you're careful with auto keying and you use undo to to undo changes that you don't actually want. Uh, and you remember that auto keying is on, it can be useful. But the problem is that you're, you're going to at some point open an animation and forget, and you're going to screw up your animation. And by the time you realize that you've done it, you might have you know, made a lot of changes to it, <laughs> added a lot of keys yeah. that you didn't mean to add. Yeah. Oh, OK, so uh, now I need to do the other side. So I'm going to be pretty much copying what I just did, just, just for the other feet. So I'm just going to do this relatively quick. Put this somewhere out there. This on here. I guess I'll I can ramble while he's doing this. So you see the buttons in the main toolbar they change to orange after he's made a change. And then when he presses K to key them, they turn red to indicate that there's a key at the at the current frame. Yeah, and what I just did before was I took all the keys I had for the torso and the head. Uh, and I, well, sorry, just for the torso, I took the keys I had for the first half of the animation and I copied them to the second half. I'm going to do the same for the head now. Just mark them and paste them in. So now I have an animation that will start to hold up when you're actually looping. I still need to do the... Uh, the feet here. And just like the other one, go in here and set it to this one. Okay. If you notice in the tree, when the bone has been edited, when the when the when a when it's been when a bone has been changed and not keyed yet, a little dot appears for that bone. And then when he presses K, it keys everything that's changed, so those dots disappear. So you can look at the tree to see if you changed bones that are not keyed yet. You can also click the dot in the tree to set a key for everything that's changed for that bone, both um, scale, rotate, and transition. I just took the took step mode off now because now I have sort of the, the extreme poses I want. There's definitely some, some tweaking that needs to be done here, so I'm just going to get started on that. Here, the, the foot is already protruding through the, the floor, so I'm going to move this key slightly and rotate it a little more. Key that. No, I'm not going to key that. Just going to change the image for now. And then here, change it to the one I had before. Key it, and then rotate it. Because the it, the rotation was happening a little too quick uh, before. Then actually start um, <clears throat> actually start changing back to the the original foot. 
I can move this up slightly, I think. There we go. When you're when you're playing it back like I am now, really slow, it looked like it like it's popping uh, the images. But once you're actually playing it back at the the speed you want, you won't notice it at all, uh, and it will look it will look smooth. So if you notice, he he for the most part would set set keys for major poses and then go in between those those keys and halfway in between or a third of the way in between and set more keys. So you slowly redefine the poses for the whole animation, starting from nothing. And here I'm I'm just tweaking uh, the positions of it. It doesn't have to be perfect, really. No. I'm just gonna tweak this, and I'm I'm happy with this now. So now I can do the other foot. I'm just gonna set the oh my one this one. Do you, do you need to do the whole the whole animation? No, I'm and I'm not gonna be doing the the entire animation because I already have that. Um, Maybe we can just get to it. Yeah. Oh yeah, go ahead. You had a question. Um, yeah, I, I know you've been asked this a few times about the freeform uh, deformation stretch goal, but um, I was noticing with the foot how you have the multiple foot assets for bending the toes. Um, it, are there plans to add anything like uh, deformations that you could have that single foot asset and actually bend that part of a single image instead of having, um, was it four images? I guess it's just three images for the bend. Um, yeah. yeah, go ahead and answer that. I'm just, I'll do this. Yeah, you animate. <laughs> so deformation would be great. Um, it's, it's a tricky thing to implement. It, it, would, it would make the, the run times more complicated. Um, the, one of the trickiest parts is actually in the UI, is the, the, what is a good way to manipulate the images so that you, you can do everything you want in a nice way and key it. Um, and we have ideas for, for how we would do it. Uh, it's just that there's so many other features that are, that are more core features that the app needs for, for more general usage. Um, deformation allows you, yeah, you, you wouldn't need three, well, two, two bent images and one normal image. You could just have one normal foot image, use deformation for the rest, and it, it would even be better because um, you wouldn't be doing an image change. It would actually... Um, be actually bending the foot, and it would use interpolation for for that bending. So it, it wouldn't the, the toe wouldn't snap. It would it would slowly bend, and it would look a lot better. Uh, but the future is complicated, and I think it's more important to do the things that are core to spine um, first, and then you know, sometime later, because we have you know a lot of promises that we made in the Kickstarter uh, to get through. But after all of those, then we'll see where we're at. Um, and we'd love to do deformation. You know, it's really, really useful for animation. And it would make it would make spine you know, really valuable. But at this time, we're we're just not sure where we'll where we'll be in in a few months after we get all the work done. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. Well, I think I'm. Uh, I think you get the get the idea of of how to do animation or how you can do animation. I mean, there's there's more ways you can do it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna switch to uh, uh, an animation that is a little more finished, and and show you that. Unless you have any more questions uh, about this topic right now. All right. So I have this one here. Uh, it's the the final one. I have a couple of animations on that. So. If I had continued what I was doing, I would have gotten something something like this. Uh, and as you can see, the hair is moving now, um, and there's there's a lot more secondary animation on it. But it's still very stiff because everything is 
is keyed um, everything is keyed linear so for example here he reaches the top point uh, with the torso and then it just immediately starts moving down usually when I mean if you throw a ball in the air it reaches a point where it moves slow and then it falls down again and that's what you'd be using the graph for to do that um, I know that the motion is coming from uh, the key on the first frame to the key on the eighth frame. So select this key here, open the graph, and then I set this to busier. And then what happens now is it moves slow in the start, and then it, it picks up speed and then slow in the end, so it hangs a bit. And then because this is still linear, it falls immediately. So I want to do the same for this. Set this to the same. Now when it gets up here, it actually hangs and then falls down. So we get a lot more uh, fluid motion going on here. I don't know how well it shows there, but there's a huge difference in, in how it displays. And one thing you can do here is Let's say you wanted to have all these keys have the same. If you select multiple keys, don't need to select the last one, and you have match on, you can just click the handles here, and it will match them all to be busier. And now they're all easing in and easing out. And, and when you do that, when, when you select multiple keys, the, the graph will use the first key you selected. Um, the handles will, will show up for the first key, and when you move them, all the rest of the keys will get the same values. Yep. Another another thing, uh, if you notice, the head is kind of detached from the, the body. Well, it is detached. There's no neck here. But I put in some extra secondary motion on it, so it actually looks like it's, it's almost escaping the, <laughs> the gravity of the, the torso, flies up, then falls down really quick at the end. So... It gives, it gives a lot of sense of weight. But there's one more thing we can add. That's uh, uh, some squash and some stretch. And there's two ways you can do this. First, uh, before I, I show you how, how it's done animating, usually when you scale something, for example, if I scale the torso here, you'll be scaling everything that is uh, apparent to it. If I put bone composition on, it, it won't be doing that. Uh, actually, now the, the torso isn't, isn't falling along, but I'll explain that in a bit. But what would happen is basically it would not create... Uh, this bone up here actually gets a key, and you can see it over, over in the tree. They all get uh, a value change because they're all compensating. They're, this, while the, the torso is scaling down, they're scaling up. And you end up with a lot of keys if you do this. Um, one thing to, where you can actually get around this in some cases um, is what I've done. Play this thing called torso single time, and I place the image on that instead of the uh, the torso bone. This means that I can actually scale this without scaling anything. Actually, let me take this off. I can scale this without scaling the head and the arm. I still want to scale the uh, the belt ends here. But it, it just enables me to, to work with less keys. And usually when you're setting up an animation, you want to work with as few keys as possible because it, it just makes it easier. So I'm just going to add some squats and stretch. Oh, yeah. OK, you had a question? Uh, can you change, yeah, can you change the, uh, the pivot point of the scale or the, the origin point from where it scales? Uh, no, uh, the the scale point is is always um, the the center of the bone. But what what you can do is, for example, if you wanted to change where there's a scale, uh, you could go into to setup pose, and you could move this. Uh, of course, I need to take bone conversation on as well. You could move this down. And now, now if I scale it, it will actually change the, the origin of it. 
Ah, great. Another way, if, if let's say if you actually wanted to have two uh, origins, um, you also wanted to have one in the center, then you would create a bone in the center and then another one in the bottom that is parented to that point and then the, the image attached to, to the last bone you've added. So then you can actually scale both of them separately using different pivot points. Great, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so I think I think I'd like to. I should point out that um, every bone you have uh, has a little bit of overhead when, when you're animating. When you go to draw it at, at runtime, um, it has to do more computations for each bone, um, and it has to have uh, separate timelines to animate that bone. So you want to minimize the number of bones for your character. But if you if you need the bones for something useful like this, then you know by all means. All right, I'm just going to get started on, on asking, adding a, a bit of a squash and stretch here. So I know that uh, the guy hits the floor here on the first frame. So I'm going to add some scale. I'm actually just going to leave the pivot uh, where, where I moved it because it may actually makes sense. So I added some scaling here. And uh, then I want him to reach this point up here where it scaled the other way around. So I'm going to stretch him up and achieve that. And now you end up with something that looks, that gets a little more light, light to it. I mean, it, this is another thing that, that takes some tweaking. And maybe actually this one here, I don't want it to, to actually scale before it, it starts hitting the floor. So I'm going to move this just one frame. Uh, actually, I'm going to move it two frames, and then change this uh, scale here to be base here, so it doesn't happen before the end. Uh, I'm just going to do like this, so it will move. It won't scale very much in the start. And then in the end, it will scale a lot. So once I do this, as you can see. It doesn't really, it changes a little on the way down, but then once we hit here, boom, it scales a lot because it's picking up the speed and it actually looks like the impact of hitting the, the ground is making it, it squash like that. So, but now this is offset from the center. I'm just gonna show you a way you can actually get around that. So first thing I'll do is I'm just gonna move this, uh, leave this here actually take uh, this frame here and move it to, let's see, I'm just going to do a little math in my head here. Uh, let's say we put it around, how many frames do we have? We have eight frames and we have 12. So we put it here. Then what will happen now is when I get reached this point, um, take it looping off for a sec. When I reach this point and it goes back to here, then it will. I'll have to add this key at this position here. But what this does is, I, I kind of lose the, uh, you know, the the graph that I've been doing. So instead of doing that, I'm just gonna. Uh, Get rid of this key here. And Sorry, I, I don't understand what's going on. I'm, I'm, I'll explain it in a second. So I've moved it out of the loop, so it actually is actually framed a bit further out. And then I set another key for the uh, the bone here at the loop. This is, this is basically just a small workflow uh, trick. I set the scale here. Uh, I see. So. Then, so you have your scale that it doesn't loop evenly with the, the rest of the animation. It actually wraps around. And so this is how you're wrapping it around. Yes. And then I'd move them. Now I actually have something that will look similar if I turn looping back on. So it's just it's just a quick way of actually offsetting your, your animation.
So, and I'll be doing this for, for pretty much all the things. I'll be doing it for the head as well, but instead of doing it manually here, I'm just gonna take the, the final thing and you can see how it, it, it actually uh, squashes and stretches the, the head as well. It's gonna be my stop sheet. Scale up a bit so you can see it. There we go. If you mouse over the, if you press play and then mouse over the image in the tree, it'll draw a box around the image, I believe, and then you'll be able to see the, the image oh, yeah. bounce, squash and stretch. Yeah, I'm not sure if it plays, but you can. I don't know if, if that plays back quick enough for you. Uh, actually, let me just quickly tweak this. And then try and play it back at a, at a different speed. So this is going to be super slow-mo. As you can see, this is one thing I didn't show yet. Uh, is that you can actually just drag a box around things. And then you can change the timing. Um, and you can do, if you want it, you can do multiple boxes. And drag them. Hold control to do multiple boxes. Now if I played back, it would be a lot slower and you might actually be able to see it in, in real time there, or something close. Alright, let me just undo that. So yeah, um, this is one way of, of, of doing, doing an animation. I mean, there are different workflows you can use with it. Some people, they like to work uh, in you know, not in step mode, but I, I prefer to do it that way. Do the extreme poses first, then do the in-betweens, and then when I have something uh, pretty, usually pretty rigid that I like, then I'll go in and actually tweak the animation. So, I think uh, it's time to ask if, if you guys want a, uh, want a small break, uh, like 10 minutes or so. I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine as well. All right, then. Well, then uh, just going to go into uh, uh, some more small things here. All right, um, so let's say you have an animation uh, or that you have an animation that you need to do uh, some uh, uh, tweaking on the images so it actually fits the images. For example, the bands up here. Uh, that I that I haven't finished the images on. Uh, if I wanted to make some images uh, to make them flow in the wind, one way I, I could do that is uh, use them as a uh, use my animation as a template, and I can go up into main menu and I can export, and I can export the entire sequence, or I can just export uh, uh, a frame, and then paint over that in, in Photoshop. Also, uh, we have the, you know, the, the export for JSON and, and binary here. And, well, GIF, JPEGs, AVIs, and, and QuickTimes. And one thing I, I actually uh, like to do is actually exporting the, the PNGs out. Um, I know I showed this, this one uh, earlier, this one here. This one I actually uh, exported out. Uh, to do the uh, images for the feet where they're bending. So I, I needed to have a, a template so I could actually see what kind of tweaking I would have to do on the on the images to, to make it look like the foot was bending. So I exported out uh, a couple of frames of the animation, uh, paste them into Photoshop and just change the, the image of the foot around a bit and then exported that out as a new image. So that, that's one way you can use it. Of course, you can also just export an entire sequence if you don't want to use your, your bones um, and, and use in, in your engines. Um, also, another thing we have is you can actually import things here. So, uh, for example, if I export the, uh, uh, the JSON here, uh, let me just change that to see if that's correct. Make a new, new folder. So if I export the JSON here, um, I've now exported all the animations. 
I can go in and I can import the animation. And we just want to have the one called run. Uh, we're just going to call it run import it. And if we apply it to the speedy skeleton. So now I've actually uh, imported the animation. So if you have uh, a skeleton, uh, this, the same skeleton, and you're working in two different projects, you can send animation from, from one skeleton to the other. Yeah, go ahead. Um, just wondering if you import an, anima an animation for a skeleton that doesn't match, does it work? Does it? It will not work. You, your okay. your um, bones have to have the same names. Yeah. In the okay. same number of bones. Yeah, but but the it doesn't do any conversion or anything. No, the the positions no. the positions of the bones uh, don't need to be the exact same in the setup pose. Um. But the names have to be the same, and the hierarchy has to be the same. Okay. So the, the import mechanism is, is also useful not just for um, passing animations and skeletons between spine projects, but if you have your data in some other format, in some other tool, maybe, maybe use Maya or something like that, or Blender, um, if you can get your data into the same format that spine uses to export, which we have documented on our website, then you can import that into Spine and use Spine as a tool to manipulate the data. All right. Um, I think it's time to jump into Photoshop for, for a little. So I'm just going to do that and uh, show you how to actually, uh, how to actually cut out the images. And I have this. Um, uh, this quick file that I've set up here. I'm just gonna clear all this paper that I have here so I can actually do some drawing. So usually I, I work with a with a Wacom tablet, and um, I mean I suggest anyone who wants to do any kind of uh, art uh, to get one of those because it it makes things a lot easier to work with. So usually, when you when you cut out things and um, you want to, for example, if I wanted to take the head here, instead of going in and cutting it out to a separate file, what I like to do is is use masks, and um, I'll just show you how, how I do this. Um, I make a I have the the main color here, and I make a duplicate of that. I do that by just holding Alt and then dragging it up, and it makes a copy of it. I'm just going to rename this one to head. And then I create a mask, again holding down alt. So everything is, is black. I'm going to hide this and hide all the different parts that don't need masks. So now if I, I paint in this mask, what will happen is it'll show what's going on beneath. If I change the color to white, and if I change it to black, it will go away. So just going to quickly draw out the head here. And then now to, to export it uh, as a head, I've created a, a, a small script for this. I'm just going to sh uh, show you. So I have these actions created, and the script uh, is, is linked to, to my actions. So the, the action, what it does is it, it scales the image. And I usually work at around 2,000 by 2,000 pixels. And then I scale it down to 33%. Uh, and then it exports it. And it will be using the, the name of the layer. So for example, I'm just going to rename it so I don't overwrite uh, the ones I had. With the, the layer selected, I just hit F5. And now I have uh, the image. I'm just going to going to quickly find that image so I can actually see. So if, if you add an image to the image folder, or you change an image in the image folder that Spine has loaded for your skeleton, it will, it will immediately show the changes in Spine. So you can work side by side with your image editor and, and manipulate the images. Yeah. Oh, actually, I think 
One place. I'm not used to working at the, this <laughs> this resolution here, so let me just see where I actually save this. Oh, there we go. Speed in you. So in here, I have this head new file here. Um, just going to preview it. And now I have an image that only has the, the head. And it automatically uh, trims it. And if you want to use the script, uh, we'll, we'll also be making that available so you, so you can use that. And this is basically what I'll be doing. So, so once I have the first one here done, then make a new copy, call this one torso, create a new mask, hide the old one, and... Isn't it sort of hard to see where you're, where you're drawing when it's, um, when, you, when you start and everything's not visible and then you have to draw? Um, I mean, I could just take this uh, old one here and, and change the opacity of that, but usually when you've been working with the same image for a long time, then you, you kind of know where things are. And, and also, it doesn't really matter uh, if, if, I, if I actually painted out something and I didn't. I, I want to, I, I could just, you know, get rid of it again. Because the, the benefit of working this way is it's, it's non-destructive. You don't lose anything by, by cutting it out, by using masks. Instead of going in and, and actually cutting out each individual uh, uh, piece, um, it, it would be destructive. It would be a very destructive workflow of doing it that way. Because if you wanted to go in and tweak something, uh, then you'd be in trouble. Also, another thing that I, I like to do is go up here to Window and Arrange in Photoshop and uh, set a new window. Because uh, usually when I work, um, I like to have, I mean, I'm working at a pretty high resolution to, to see what's going on. But I also want to be able to preview the art at the, the, the correct size. So I'll be working at something like this. But then I can see a preview of the, the actual size that I'm going to be exporting it at. So, yeah, let me just see if I've forgotten anything here. So you, so you use a mask because um, it's a non-destructive way to cut out the images. If, if you had a part of your character that overlapped, like if the head was closer to the torso, um, what would you have to do? Well, um, Usually, and, and this, then I would I would put them in a in a in a different layer, like I've done here with the, the hair, because the hair is 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 overlapping. The hair is overlapping uh, the head, and I know that uh, I want those to be a separate image, so I put them in a different layer. Sometimes it, you might accidentally merge two layers, but and then you'll just have to repaint some some small parts of it. Um, but this is definitely the the easiest way to do it. I'll be doing the same, I mean, for the belt here. Then we have the foot ends, and as you can see, they're not completely done yet, but they'll be behind. So it'll be pretty simple for me to actually go in and, and paint those out. And I don't need to have a mask for those because they're on their own separate layer. So, so yeah, um, we're uh, we're getting pretty close to the, to the end here. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, we'll uh, kind of set off like 20 minutes or so for, uh, for questions. So um, if you have any, just, uh, just uh, start asking. None for me. All right. I think I got them all out during the presentation. All right. Cool. Okay. Uh... I'm just getting started on the other hand, so um, <laughs> basically uh, I wanted to know, uh, do, you do you plan to add export options um, like in your basic spine animation? Uh, do you plan to have events that are not linked to bones? Like uh, uh, we call them triggers usually. Let's say when the, the foot hits the floor, uh, you would have, you, you could add in your animation a sort of trigger at that moment. So when you read it in a game engine, you would know to play the footstep sound, for instance. Do you have any plans on that line? Or? 
Yes, we do. Uh, one of the stretch goals was for an event timeline, and that's what that would be. Um, we, uh, it, it's, it was pretty far down on the stretch goals, so there's a lot of stuff we'll do first. Um, but we, we had some brief conversations about how we do it. Um, basically, there would be an events folder in, under the skeleton. So you'd go there and you would create a new event. So you'd call it, say, footstep or, or footstep sound. Um, then during the animation, you would scrub to the timeline position where you want the event. And you would press the key icon in the key column in the tree, similar to how you key slots for image changes. That would set a key for the footstep event at that timeline position. Um, a row in the dope sheet would show up for that, for, for the footstep sound. Um, and then in your game, you would, you would just get a string that's the key for, for the event. Um, and when it happens in the animation, you would have a hook to be able to take whatever action you want. You could, you could spawn particles or play sounds or, or do whatever you'd like. Awesome. Yeah, one, one thing, and, and since we, we don't have that in yet, uh, we, we can't show you the workflow for it. But basically, we, we want to keep everything consistent. For example, when, when we add a drawable key order, it will uh, work the same way as, as when you're actually keying, uh, you know, which image you want to have shown. Um, so it will it'll be working the same way. We're going to be keeping things consistent all through. So it will so, to get into the new features. Yeah, for, for draw order, you would, um, in animate mode, you would reorder the slots and then a little dot would appear where he has the mouse currently in the key column, just like for, for when you change the image for a slot, and then you would key the draw order, and it would show up in the dump sheet and change at that position. Cool. So in the meantime, we don't have keyable draw order, but you can use two slots. So say you had an animation where, um, say, uh, you have a bone that, that is circling your character's head, so you, you could have one slot in front of the head and one slot behind the head. Then as the bone moves back and forth around the character's head, you, you would show the image in front in the slot in front. And as it goes behind the head, you would hide it in front and show the image in the, in the, the back slot as a workaround until we have cable draw order. OK. Um, second question is, uh, I've noticed in the documents you shared uh, before the presentation, just the kind of uh, workflow or the, the, the backlog that you have for what you have planned for the, the software. Uh, you just have an item called Texture Packer. I was wondering if uh, you plan to actually make a texture packing uh, plugin for Spine, or you just uh, want to make a, a sort of plugin for the software that's called Texture Packer? No, the, the texture packing in Spine will be uh, the Texture Packer from LibGDX. Uh, oh, okay. it'll, be, it'll be integrated into Spine. It'll be Spine's own Texture Packer. Uh, and the way, the way it works is um, Spine currently doesn't really, it, it works on individual images. So you have a directory full, full of individual images, you attach them to your bones and you animate. Um, when, you, when you export the animation data, it just uses the, the name. It's actually the path relative to what you set for the image folder. It, it, that's just a key in the data. It's just a string. So at runtime, you can do anything you want to look up or draw. You know, you could render an SVG, or you can look up a region in a texture atlas, or you could load an individual file using that string. So Spine, Spine doesn't need texture packing itself. You need the texture packing at runtime in whatever game toolkit you use. So putting the texture packer in Spine would, would just be a convenience for users to not have to you know, buy another tool to do the texture packing. Um, and it, it's also a little bit more integrated into the workflow. When you, you save out the, the uh, animation data, you can also have it pack all your textures in one step so you can more quickly use it in your game. Okay. Um, just have two small questions to, to finish up with. Um, first of all, uh, do you have any plans to separate the, I call them mount points, but for instance, for the, the hair and the, 
the hood ends, uh, you know, they're, they're still bones. Um, I understand that's how it works. Like in Blender, whenever you animate anything and you export it to a game engine, everything's a bone. Uh, do you plan to keep that structure or do you plan to really separate bones and uh, basically bones of zero length into a new sort of entity? Um, no, I think I think bones. Well, right. So the the bones with the zero length are really just bones, same as any bone. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the one of the things that might be relevant to your question is uh, for deformation. What what we what we would do for that is allow you to to move the the vertices of the images and and key them all. So once you're doing that, you can have an image that's attached to a bone. Um, we call it an attachment offset, which you currently define in setup mode. And that attachment offset cannot change in animations. So okay. the image is positioned relative to the bone. You know that's the same in animate mode. So to move to move an image to a to uh, a different point, you, you can't move it to a different point relative to the bone. You would have to create a new bone, and then you'd be able to move that image wherever you like. So if we had deformation, then you'd be able to move all the vertices of an image relative to the bone during an animation, um, normally to deform the image. But if you move them all the same amount, then you'd be able to move the attachment point yeah, of the I'm image. I was wondering uh, if you, you wanted to keep the way it's, uh, it's working right now or add a new sort of entity just for the user readability, basically. It's, that, that was my question fairly simple. Oh. I make it simple. Okay, so, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it's it's more clear that you're animating with bones. I don't think we'd want to hide that. Um, bones have some overhead, you know, there's there's matrix multiplications that happen for each bone. So you don't want to have, you know, just tons of bones. And also with the slot system that we're using, um, you, it's really tied to the bones, so all the images in, in slots for a bone, they, they um, Get manipulated based on what happens to the bone. So spine is spine is very bone centric, and I, I think it's probably the approach we'll, we'll stay with. Perfect. Uh, really, my last question: uh, Do you have any plans to add more complex uh, inverse kinematics, uh, like having a parent bone be able to, to to automatically modify its children bone by a certain amount? Uh, Stuff like that, stuff that you'd find in a 3D animation package. Well, actually, um, we, we, yeah. Do you mean at runtime, or for posing the skeleton? Uh, basically, just in spine directly. Yeah, that's actually one thing I didn't show. Uh, so I'll just quickly do that. That's actually a good thing that. Uh, I'm just gonna say this as a new project. There we go. Let's see. I'm going to show you this. So when you're in, in setup mode, you can use this post tool down here. And uh, I'm just going to create a couple of bones. So You can use it in animation mode as well. Yeah, well, um, yeah, uh, but not for animation per se. So with the post, post tool active, I've, I can select these two bones, and a small uh, divot will appear out here. And now I can actually move things around uh, using IK. Oh, okay, this, cool, cool. This works for um, uh, this works for even more bones, so I can add like as many as I want. Really, I've tested this out with like 300 bones. It 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 becomes a little more difficult to control, of course. Usually, uh, when you do uh, IK, you you usually just stick with two bones. So, but yeah, uh, we oh, do we do very yeah. cool for me. So the good thing is it's sort of a hidden feature because you have to select multiple bones. Um, you can even select bones that are not connected. It doesn't care. Like if you selected the first and the last bone, wow. you could you could still. Um, hmm? <laughs> that's strange. Oh well. Ah, that's a bug. We're not supposed to show bugs. Oh. <laughs> well. Yeah. yeah I so. Tell. <laughs> Unfortunately, this is being recorded. Um, yeah, you have to select multiple bones with the pose tool, so um, it isn't always 
obvious that IK is there. Um, but we do have IK for posing the skeleton. Um, we don't have IK for runtime. So you, you can't use IK to avoid having to set keys. Um, IKs can be very useful at runtime to, to do things like uh, have a character crouch on an uneven surface and have the, the feet be positioned on the surface and then have the, the parent bones positioned you know, correctly, like the knees would bend and everything to keep your character from, from looking strange. Um, that's quite complicated and affects all the runtimes. But So we don't have that, we just have posing. Yeah, just to have it as a tool to, to be able to, to, to model with is really awesome already. So, cool. That, that was all my questions. All right. There's just uh, one thing that uh, I didn't show and I just wanted to do now. Uh, so, this uh, animation here, one thing you can do, uh, let's say I wanted to make this guy uh, look a little different. So, I could do this. And we're actually. You know, because I've changed the, the setup post, it actually goes through the uh, to the animate mode here. So, and the same thing if if I wanted him to look very strange when he's running. See, just by doing a, a couple of changes in the setup post, you can actually get some variation in in your animations. That that would be hard to get. Otherwise, so that's another way of, of using it. And also, I didn't show the, the axes down here, uh, the local, parent, and global. And global is what I use most of the time, really. But sometimes you want to be able to, to move something along uh, its local axes. So now I'm moving this bone on the, on the local axes. And let's say I wanted to move this head. Uh, along the axes of uh, its parent. I'll select the bow and set it to parent. Now when I move it, I'll be moving al along the, uh, the parent position. That is cool. So, so now he looks, okay. he looks really, really goofy now when he runs. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, the way to sum that up is to say that the animations are applied relative to the bind pose. So the bind pose can be manipulated, and all of the animations will will just be applied to that. And that actually happens at runtime. So if you wanted your character to look up at runtime, an easy way to do that, to have him look up during all of his animations, no matter what they are, is to programmatically manipulate the bind pose to have him look up or look towards the, the mouse position. Now, now he looks like his... his yeah, sorry, just go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, from what I've seen in the JSON file, uh, your your bind pose is basically whatever that frame zero, I guess? Um, no, the bind pose is what's, what you define in the setup mode. We call it the setup pose or the, set, or the bind pose. Okay, but I mean when you export it to a, to a file. Um, oh, is, right. Um, Let me just open up one of the example JSON files. So yes, the bind pose is what's defined in the bones section. The bind pose is really, uh, it's defined in both the bones and the slot section. So the bones are the actual bind pose positioning. And the slots, uh, they, have a, they can have an optional color and attachment. And that's the bind pose color and attachment. And then the, the animation data is all relative to the bind pose. So it needs to be combined at runtime. Cool. That was clear. Okay. Cool. I guess another thing we can show is the bone length tool, which is uh, yeah. sort of hidden. <laughs> if you have one of the uh, transform tools active and you have a bone selected, you can uh, move to the tip of it and get this thing here that you can use to scale the bone. And see, if I move it all the way down, it turns into a, what I, I usually refer to as a null. A zero link bone? Yep. So 
There's also some other some other little things that are not so apparent. Um, uh, with the rotate tool, you can hold shift, and that will move at increments of 15 degrees, I think, which can be useful if you wanted to get like a 45 degree angle without typing it in. Yeah. There's also um, the the text boxes in the main toolbar. You can you can click and drag them up and down to to change them. Or use the mouse wheel. Yeah, you can also mouse wheel. Mouse wheel uh, does a smaller increment, so the, you can mouse wheel to get a, a, a very fine um, to change it to a small amount. Just a shortcut for typing in values or clicking and dragging. And another thing is uh, rotation is additive, and this is uh, one of the things that I I find really useful um, if you have longer chains is. If I have these bones here selected and rotation, then I can rotate them. They they rotate additively. So this is this is really handy. And if I, for example, if I were to go in and set bone on and rotate, then suddenly you can now rotate them separately. They won't follow their pattern around. That just means if you use that in animation, you would actually need to uh, to key the uh, uh, you'd actually need to key the uh, the transform as well. So, for example, if I go into animate mode here and set a key here on the first frame and a key here, then it looks it looks as it should. If I then set a key here with bone composition on. As you can see, translate also turns orange here, which means there's a key for that. So, but I also need to set the key uh, for that at at the the previous frame. So, it's gonna move that. There we go. So now you can actually explode your. Uh, the skeleton like that. I can make special effects with that. It's pretty cool. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, we could show the name tags. Oh yeah. We have name tags down here, both for images and bones, and you can actually use those to to select what you want. You can actually click on the name tag text itself. In a, in a complex skeleton, there's there's usually many more names. Sometimes it can be difficult, especially when bones are on top of each other, to select the correct bone. And the name tags are, are convenient for that. So like like here, a lot of, lot of the bones, really small. If I zoom in, you'll be able to see. If I zoom out, the, the name tags will actually spread out so you can so you can select what's going on. Uh, I'm trying to think of other little little tricks. Uh, I tend to d double click to select. Soren likes to press spacebar, but I like to double click. Yeah, to, to deselect. <laughs> I, I, I like spacebar. That's what I'm... <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Um, on Windows, if you right click the X button in the upper right, be careful you don't left click it, that'll close the application. <laughs> if you right click it once, it will, um, the window will be always on top of other windows. Oh, cool. Um, and if you right click it again, then it will turn that off. Uh, we should really add some visual indicator that that's on, but that can be convenient for um, putting spine on top of, say, Photoshop in a corner and then changing images and having them update automatically in spine. Um, you could show the scroll to button in the tree. So now it's it's off, and selected a bone here, but it didn't actually select it in the, the tree. So if I turn it on, it'll actually go to it. It it selected it in the tree, I think, but it didn't um, it, just, it didn't expand to it. It didn't focus on on the selection. So I'm just gonna take this down again, turn it off, and I select the bone here. And then it will go to it. 
the reason we, we put this in is if you have really large chains, um, you might end up with a lot of scrolling up and down. So it's, it's nice to have that up there to, uh, so you don't end up with a huge free hierarchy uh, in no time because you'll be selecting all the bones. Sometimes you just want to keep it small. For the, for the, the ninja character, which, which didn't have that many uh, bones in it, it's not a big issue. But if you have a lot of bones, then sometimes you don't want everything to just expand automatically. What's the average bone count that you determined was like, you know, in, in the, the, the area where pe people would most use it? I think it really depends on what character, what, what sort of things you're building with spine. Yeah, it doesn't have to just be characters. It, it really depends. For, for example, the uh, uh, spine boy uh, character, it, I mean, it has uh, bones for the, for the upper leg and the lower leg. Uh, for both legs and upper arm and lower arm, so that's already uh, eight more bones there, and also has the neck. Um, it 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 really depends, so it's it's hard to say. I mean, some some bones, uh, oh sorry, some uh, some things don't need that many bones. Uh, for example, the power up project here. It it has well, it has a few bones, but that's. A bunch of bones. <laughs> um, yeah, that's another thing. Uh, you can actually hide the bones, but you can still uh, you can still select them by just hovering over them. So if you know where they are, <laughs> and that's that usually yeah. yeah, it's something you'll. I mean, when you set it up, you'll you'll know where you have your bones. You just hover over and, and they pop up. So. And this this particular. Animation uses or skeleton uses a lot of null bones, zero length bones. So this isn't a great example. Usually, it's easier to mouse over the bones because they're larger. Maybe the dragon, yeah. like the dragon. Yeah, this is a lot easier to select your bones. And you can manipulate the bones even though they're hidden. Once you select them, you're good. You can also draw a box to select if you have no selection. Yeah. So yeah, you can you can still select them. Uh, you won't see the labels though, unless you set them to visible. There's a uh, in the tree. There's three buttons. Well, first there's collapse and expand. So if nothing is selected in the tree and you hit expand, it expands everything. Same with collapse. But if you select just one single node in the tree, it'll it'll only expand or collapse that node and below. So you can collapse just a portion of the tree and all of its children, or expand just a portion of the tree, if you like. And also the filter buttons in the tree, in the upper left part of the tree. If you're manipulating bones a lot, and you don't need to look at you know, the 100 images that you have attached, it can really save you a lot of scrolling up and down to be able to hide all the slots and images. Or if you're working with just images or just slots, then it's easier that way. Yeah, for this. This animation here, I like to point out that uh, the guy who made this um, was, he'd only been using Spine for a couple of days, so we were kind of blown away when we saw this animation. It was, it was really, it was really impressive uh, for us. And, and also, I mean, one thing that, that definitely motivates us to, to improve on Spine. Yeah, he's he's really good at art, and he's a really good animator, and he picked it up quickly. So, um, if you have repeat on, and you're you're scrubbing the timeline, if you if you start your scrub inside the timeline and you go past the end, then the timeline position will wrap to the beginning automatically, and that just sort of help you helps you visualize um, the the animation. If you start your scrub outside of the the last key, then it won't do that. So if you wanted to move the timeline position, you could either just click past the end of the animation or turn off repeat. There's also a little tiny button underneath repeat for framing your, it, it scales the timeline so that it fits in the window. You can also mouse wheel if you're over the timeline and that will change, it will zoom the timeline to the mouse position. 
So if you want to zoom in or out quickly with the mouse wheel, you can do that. And you can right click and drag the timeline as well. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really important. Oh, you could show how, how you set the loop start and end. Yep. Also the current position for a very long animation that's useful. So you, you click, you, you choose a timeline position and then click loop start, choose another position, loop end, and then when you play with loop on, it will repeat only that section. And that could be useful for tweaking a particular se section. If you have the timeline zoomed in a whole lot, this, this animation is very short, it's only, it's only 30 frames. Um, if you have a much longer animation, then if current is, is checked and you, and you have uh, repeat off and you hit play, you can just do it with this one. Just turn off repeat. Oh. Hit current. Yeah, hit, hit current and then hit play. And you'll see that the, the, the timeline will automatically scroll to keep the, the current position centered. Yeah, I can show it on a on the uh, Spinosaurus example because it has oh yeah a lot more frames. Yep, it has a lot more. Frames. When when the when the timeline has lots of keys in it, a scroll bar will appear. You can click and drag that to jump to different different parts of the timeline. Yeah, I think that's a uh, a lot of the little the little hidden features that you might not encounter. Well, we'll be writing proper documentation. It's just we have lots of things to do and. Everything wants. Everyone wants everything done at once. So we're doing our best. Yeah, you had a question. Uh, yeah, can you talk a little bit about the support for animation blending? Sure. So the way that works is at runtime, you uh, you have an animation object, and you can apply that to a skeleton. You have an animation object specifically for a skeleton, um, and it poses that skeleton at a time that you give. So, and that time that you give is is, is similar to the, a timeline position. Uh, so you need to keep track of the, the state of your character. So if your character has been in an animation a certain amount of time, you need to pass that time to the animation and it will pose your skeleton. That's how you would do, you know, straight, you know, not, not mixed animation. Uh, if you wanted to mix your animation, then you pose your, your skeleton with the first animation, and then you mix that pose with uh, another animation. So for example, if you want your guy to walk and then jump, first you would pose him for wherever he would be walking. Then you would pose, then you would mix it with the jump animation and you provide an alpha value from between zero and one, and that's how much blending would happen. So typically, you would have the blending, uh, you would have the you would track the blending similar to how you track the state. So you, you know that you're mixing these two animations for a certain amount of time, and you want the blending to change from zero to one over that amount of time. And that will that will mean that uh, he's walking. Then you start blending at zero, so it does it, it's just walking. Then as as you go from zero to one with the blending, it go it, it blends more and more towards the the jumping for for a short amount of time. And then you would then the jumping would take over and you would only be jumping until you went to land. So there's there's some complicated state management there. It, it's not really that complicated. It's just, you know, now I'm walking, now I'm now I'm blending from walking to jumping, now I'm jumping. You, you manage that and you just just apply your first animation and then mix it with your second animation. Um, there's an example of that. Oh sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say um, that covers the sort of like going transitioning from one animation to another smoothly. But is there something for essentially running two animations uh, in parallel with each other? And you're not trying to transition from one to another. Something like um, 
you know, running in one direction and the character turns their head to look at, or, you know, moves their head up and down to look at something interesting. Not controlled by mouse, but just as they run by an interesting object. So you want them to be uh, looking down while also running. So you're not transitioning to the head look, but running both animations in parallel. Right. So, mm, but there's a couple ways you can do that. Um, you have you have access to all the bones, so you could you could apply your running animation and then uh, and then programmatically set the rotation on say the head bone so that it, he he's looking at whatever's interesting. Um, that that might be that might be what you want in in some cases. In other cases, you're going to want to you're going to want his head to, to animate. You, you don't want it to just point at, at the thing, but you want it to to smoothly move towards something. And in that case, you would you, you would essentially do the same thing as as transitioning from running to jumping. But your second animation, you would programmatically generate that. So you'd have an animation that says, you know, he's going to rotate until he's looking at this position. And then you keep track of how much time has passed, and and you mix the two. So he's running, and then you're mixing that with his head turning. Yeah, one one thing we we talked about uh, a while back um, was to have uh, animation layers, where you, where, so you could actually blend between them by using uh, setting a weight for them, and have them blend on top of each other. But um, it's it's not something that we've we've added as a as a goal yet, but it's something that that might make it in in, in the future. All right, I think I understand. Um, just for another example, so I can wrap my head around it a bit more. Uh, this is an example from Artisan, so it's, it's one that I know a little bit better. Um, we have a bow and arrow craft, and we want to let the player um, start charging up the, the bow and arrow um, and be able to charge it back, up, which is to pull the string back <clears throat> while they're standing, running, jumping. Um, and we can't do that currently because we don't have we can only play singular animations at, at a time. So the support we need for that is, you know, the upper body arms are pulling a bow and arrow back and you can be doing that while you're idling or while you're running or while you're jumping by blending the, the pulling of the arrow back with those other animations. So you, you're, say your guy is idling. Um, if, you're, if you're animating the arms moving around, while he's idling, you know, it's not a great example, but say you were, um, what would you want the arms to do if you were blending it with the bow and arrow animation? I, I think what you'd want is to, to not animate the arms and only apply the, the arm animation for the bow and arrow. Is that right? Um, I think so. I mean, yeah, you, you can sort of imagine there's a, a bow and arrow charging idle, which is just standing and pulling the bow and arrow back. Um, but wanting to mix that with a running animation, I'm not sure how we would do that yeah. um, without some sort of blending. I, I, th I think I know what you, what you, what you mean. Uh, you basically want to have an animation that, that only affects the, the arms, uh, where he's, he's pulling back uh, the, the, the bowstring, uh, and then uh, another animation where he's either walking or idle or, or something like that um, to, to be played on top of that. So you have two animations playing at the same time with the same skeleton. Yeah. Okay. To do that, you would apply first your running animation, and then you, you, your second animation you would apply it on top of it, and it would only change the bones that it has keys for. So if your second animation was the animation to pull back and hold the bow, then when you're running, um, the arms would would only be set to where the the bow animation set them to. Um, it might not look smooth because it say your running has the running has large arm movements. So if you're mixing the running animation with your bow animation, the large arm movements from the from the running is going to make your bow animation look messed up. So you, I think you really want to override any of the the bone positions from the the first animation with the second one. And to do that in the API, you would just apply the second one instead of mixing it. Yeah, or or you could do an in great great. In, uh, an in-between animation, um, so, so the blend would be smoother. So, so you have him running with the arms swinging, and then you'd have him running. You just basically duplicate the, the run animation, uh, give it a different name, uh, and and then 
don't have his arm move his arms moving in that animation, then you could blend the two uh, really uh, smoothly. Ah, uh, gotcha. Great. There was a guy in the Corona forums. Let me find the link. And uh, he's relatively new to to game development. And in a few days, he he uh, integrated Spine with his game, and, and he did some mixing, which is pretty neat. He did you know, what he did actually was he, he programmatically g generates uh, animations based on I think where you're touching, so that his guy will will rotate to that to that like the guy's head and the weapon moves and points to where you're touching, um, and it doesn't just instantly point there, but it actually animates to that position. So that's pretty neat. Uh, almost found the link. On the user trying to find his post. While I, while you find that, um, I just yeah. the the spine boy example. As you can see, the uh, the jump animation. It just jumps up in the air, but it's actually animated for him to move um, horizontally. So, for example, let me just see how many frames I actually have here. Quite a lot. Um, so here, I would uh, move him. Oh, I actually have bone compensation on. Let me turn that off. That will happen to you quite often. So, like there. And then, key this here. So, yeah. This is just really, I mean, I haven't, this is not tweaked very well. Um, but basically, that's what you would be doing pro programmatically. Actually, setting your moving, yeah, moving the root bone instead of doing it in in the animation. And you can you can always while you're animating, you can always do the animation on the root. Just make sure that you get rid of the keys afterwards. Yeah, if you save, if you there's been a couple of forum users that, that have done that. If you key your root bone, it it makes it. Uh, a little confusing at runtime why you can't position the root bomb. Because when you apply the animation, it, it positions your character, um, and then you have to set the root bomb after you apply the animation. So I, I pasted the link into the chat um, for the guy's game. Skip to around the middle to see him moving around and aiming, but it was it was interesting that someone new to game development could could relatively easily put animations in their game and, and even you know, generate the, the animations at runtime. Yeah, well, uh, I think uh, I think I'm gonna wrap up the uh, the recording at least. Um, if you have any more questions before we do that, then uh, now's the time. <laughs> but I, I think we've covered everything so far. Yeah, thanks so much. This has been great. Cool. Yeah, you've been pretty thorough, so. That's great. That's great. <laughs> Happy to uh, to help. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the recording here.